Hi, um, I'm Alicia. I'm a PhD candidate in Brett Nyland's group. And yeah, I'm here to talk to you about our work on understanding differential toxin profiles uh, between two cytonema strains. So firstly, an introduction to uh, paralytic shellfish toxins. So they're a class of a family, you could say, of toxins produced by cyanobacteria um, and dinoflagellates. And the main member of this family is saxitoxin, which you see here. So they all share a tricyclic alkaloid um, structure, and they're the most potent form of a class of cyanobacterial toxins. They work by binding to sodium channels in nerves, leading to nerve blockage, paralysis, and then death. Now, as you can see here, they're produced by quite a large number of cyanobacterial genera. And of, from this core structure, which is saxitoxin, you can have modifications to three functional groups shown here. Uh, this can be either a single modification or a combination of modifications. And all these modifications together give rise to the 57 uh, naturally occurring analogs of saxitoxin that we detect in nature. Now, all of these analogs will actually vary in their toxicity and their target. So the addition of a sulfate group to saxitoxin can reduce its toxicity, whereas the uh, introduction of a hydroxy group can increase its water solubility. Uh, in terms of targets, the different analogs will have preference into which nerves they bind in, whether that's in the skin or in the heart. So uh, it's incredibly important to understand not just the mechanisms of saxitoxin, but it's, uh, and the biosynthesis of not just saxitoxin, but its other analogs as well. So what do we know of paralytic shellfish toxin biosynthesis? Well, the biosynthetic cluster was first described in 2008 by our group, and now it's been found in six species of cyanobacteria, which I show below here. Now, as you can see, the biosynthetic cluster, named the SXT cluster, all vary in size between all these different species, but they also vary in gene presence and um, in organization. The consensus, however, is that there's the same 10 genes that produce the core structure of saxitoxin. And from, the, that, from there, this core structure is then modified by either one or several tailoring enzymes that add those um, different additions to those functional groups to give rise to those analogs of varying um, activity. And each cluster will vary in what ta tailoring enzymes they have. Thus, the functions of these enzymes um, have really only been predicted by us correlating bioinformatic data, and that is of the gene and protein sequence, to that of the toxin pr profiles of each um, species. But we really don't know uh, experimentally how these analogs arise and what mechanisms create them. And so our group decided to investigate further by the biochemistry in, uh, behind the creation of paralytic shellfish toxins. And so we chose to do so in two strains of Cytonema crispum, which were isolated both from the South Island of New Zealand, uh, both from regions in which they could have easily come into contact with humans. Uh, the first strain, Cytonema crispum core BG524, which I'll from now on just refer to as 524, was a isolated from the groins, which is a recreational um, lake system in the South Island, whereas the other strain, Cytonema crispum Corby G72, was isolated from the South Island drinking water reservoir. Now, interestingly, the first strain, 524, only produces saxitoxin, whereas the second strain, uh, 72, produced saxitoxin as well as a whole array of other paralytic shellfish toxins, uh, not just the ones that are listed here. Now, this is really the first time this kind of difference has been seen. So normally in uh, cyanobacteria such as aphanosomenon or in anabena, strains of the same species will produce the same toxins or incredibly similar toxin profiles, but just at varying levels. Whereas here, we're having completely different toxins, um, paralytic shell shellfish toxins being made. So 
we thought that this was a, too, a great candidate situation for us to study how these paralytic shellfish toxins are being made. And we did so by um, sequencing the genomes um, and analyzing it and then doing phylogenetic uh, studies on it. And then from there, taking one of the genes, cloning it, uh, and expressing it, and then doing enzymology studies. So we actually have that experimental evidence as to how these things are made, which, which really has been, before the study, completely lacking. So what we found were the two largest saxitoxin biosynthetic clusters ever reported. So the first one by strain 524 was 54 kilobase pairs in size, and the second one by strain 72 was 47 kilobase pairs in size. To give you context, that's 20 kilobase pairs larger than all other described clusters. Uh, and this really comes down to two things. One, the clusters are incredibly abundant in transposases, so 19 out of 50 genes in these clusters were transposases, uh, which are basically fragments of DNA that are able to just move around the genome. Uh, and secondly, they have the greatest abundance of saxitoxin genes. What I mean by that is in all saxitoxin biosynthetic clusters, there's different genes that are associated with the cluster, and that's called a saxitoxin gene. Um, but each cluster will vary in what genes it has. These clusters have almost all known genes we've ever found in association with saxitoxin. So genetically, they have the potential to produce almost all known <laughs> paralytic shellfish toxins. Um, but what brought the other question is, because it has almost all the genes, is this, did these clusters evolve from a predecessor of the saxitoxin cluster, in which through deleting parts of it gave rise to all the other smaller saxitoxin clusters? And through phylogenetic studies, we found, no, it wasn't. Um, so the phylogeny of core saxitoxin genes, that is the genes that are used to make saxitoxin itself, correlates very strongly to uh, the phylogeny of 16S rRNA, which suggests that the ability to produce saxitoxin itself has been vertically inherited through the evolution of cyanobacteria. However, for tailoring enzymes, SXTN, SXT diox, and SXTT, we found that the, the sequence from cytonema was the common ancestor for these SXT genes, the last, latter two arising from a duplication event. Uh, and what this means is that from, it, from an ancestor of this species arose the ability to produce um, other versions of saxitoxin, and this was then horizontally transferred to other cyanobacterial species so that they too could produce other versions of saxitoxin that vary in toxicity, not just saxitoxin itself. But what we also found, looking closer into these gene clusters, is that these transposases were able to incorporate themselves into the, th the genes of three tailoring enzymes. Um, SXTN, a predicted sulfur transferase, so predicted to put sulfate groups onto saxitoxin. SXTO and APS kinase, which is predicted to make a sulfur donor to put sulfate groups onto saxitoxin. And then the last one is a deoxygenase, which adds hydroxyl groups to saxitoxin. And what we found is that these transposases were actually able to split the genes into two in this top strain, whereas the genes were completely intact in this bottom strain. Now, if I can remind you, this top strain, 524, is the one that only produced saxitoxin, whereas the bottom strain is the one that is able to produce the whole array of paralytic shellfish toxins. And it can do that because all its genes are still intact, whereas this bottom one, uh, this top one, has lost the ability to make the other paralytic shellfish toxins since its genes have been disrupted, so they can't work anymore, so there is not the ability to transform saxitoxin. But as I said before, there really is an experimental evidence as to what the activity of these genes are. So we decided to look further into that by cloning this gene, SXTN, uh, and biochemically characterizing it. 
And in doing so, um, so we took the enzyme and we tried to figure out what substrates it used. Um, and in doing so, we found that it bound really strongly to phosphoadenosine phosphosulfate, which is the universal sulfate donor, and um, saxitoxin, which is suggestive that this enzyme is able to take a sulfate group and add it to saxitoxin. We then did in vitro activity um, to try and see if it could do this, if we could make the enzyme do it, and we could. So we, when we gave the enzyme saxitoxin, we saw it converted to gonioxin 5, uh, so which is the first proof that the enzyme is an N21 sulfur transferase. Uh, what we also found is that it couldn't convert anything else. So as you can see, it adds a sulfate group here, but it can't convert anything else that adds the sulfate group here, which is the first evidence that the biosynthesis of all the paralytic shellfish toxins does not occur in a random manner, but has to follow this route instead of this route. Uh, so to conclude, we found the largest saxitoxin clusters to date. The abundance of transposases in them caused insertions into genes, uh, which enabled a strain to produce other paralytic shellfish toxins. We uh, found the we <laughs> generated the first biochemical proof for the activity of one of these tailoring enzymes, um, and found that biosynthesis of paralytic shellfish toxins follows a predefined route. Um, however, I'd like to just finish on that biochemical characterization of these pathways is still incredibly lacking, and it's only with the knowledge of how not just a core structure of a toxin, but how its other analogs are made that we can truly manage and mitigate the risks from them. Thank you, I'd just like to acknowledge my group and the government. <laughs> Thank you, Alicia. That's, um, that's a mountain of work there in that presentation. Um, just kicking off with the first question. So compared to other secondary metabolite gene clusters, yeah. is this a really large cluster yes. or it is? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, the saxitoxin biosynthetic gene cluster is not the largest one. Uh, so the microsystem gene cluster is, is larger. But considering that the saxitoxin cluster, uh, molecule itself is the smallest toxin uh, class, compared to all the other ones, it's amazing that the genes it uses to make it is, is so large. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Sorry if this is a little bit left no, field, no, but I was wondering um, how the saxitoxin gene clusters from cyanobacteria related to those that you might see from marine algae. Um, so, at first, th there's a whole discussion as to how they got there. So the genes themselves are the same, uh, but in, in marine algae, instead of all the genes being together, they are in all different, each gene is in a different part of the genome, and they just somehow have figured out a way to come together and work together. Um, but genetically, they are very similar. Yes. I'll sneak one last one in. Um, so the transposases, are, yes. are they peculiar or are they your stock standard transposes? No. Uh, well, the transposes themselves are, are commonly found transposases, um, but it's not common to see this amount because um, they're, they're the ones that are responsible for being able to remove genes. And so in non-toxic cyanobacteria, they're the ones that you see have caused a cluster to exit, and you can actually trace the marks that have caused the exit of that toxin cluster so that that strain is no longer toxic. Thanks, Alicia. No. Great talk.